Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1. We have, we have made it through four chapters, and, and so we're in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Last week, we left off with a great reminder as to how much we need others. We, we need one another in our lives. We must be careful not to get sucked into today's mindset of, of hibernating and privacy and putting those walls up and, and drawing those lines and isolating ourselves. That, that's a movement that's going on among so many. So many are just fine huddled up in their own place with their dogs. And I don't know why I said dogs, but you know, you just stuff like that. But so, so now I guess you could say, after we talked about our need of one another, that we're moving on from fellowship to worship tonight. We have taken a journey with Solomon through this world, with his experience, with all of his money, with all of his power, his position, his possessions, his venture into pleasure, and none of it produced joy, any peace, no fulfillment, and no satisfaction with him. On that journey and everything he experienced and experimented with, there, there would be nothing for us to go on that journey and to end up having of eternal value and, and just no satisfaction. You know, I think I understand why the name of that show, I don't remember the name of the show, it was something like, it was something like, uh, Winning the lottery ruined my life, or the lottery ruined my life, and and I can I can see some of those stories and why they took place because of what they did with it, and well, how the if you ask me how they got it, but anyway, now our attention turns from the gutter, if you will, of this world to God. Now, after this journey in the world with Solomon. Now he takes us into the house of God to worship the Lord. And God has made some points in His Word here about us going into His house to worship Him. And so we're going to look at, at about four things tonight and concerning going into the house of the Lord to worship Him. And one is conduct. Another is, I'll just say, concentration. Another is communication. And then we have one we'll close with on commitment. Let's first look at conduct concerning the house of God and worshiping the Lord. The beginning of verse 1 says, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. This does not mean we need to add a third ordinance to this church that we observe. What, what, what are the two ordinances we observe? And, and the Lord's Supper. This verse does not mean that we need to add a foot washing ordinance to the church. You, you wouldn't believe what some people think about it. You know, uh, if anybody thinks it's wrong that I tap my foot, I know I've caught myself and I notice I tap my foot to to music in in the church. And and you wouldn't believe the people who who would say that that's what this means, that you shouldn't do something like that. Keep thy foot. Uh, when we look at the phrase keep thy foot, let's let's look at the words that we have here. That first word is keep. And, and that word keep means to, to build a garrison around. It means to protect. It means to guard. And then that word foot would speak of our steps. So what we have here is a guarding of our steps, a watching of our steps. When our feet take us to the house of God, we need to watch our steps. 
as we need to consider where we are and what we're here to do and to have the appropriate conduct in the house of God. This is the house of God. Our our minds should be on the Lord when we come to the house of God. And that should affect our behavior. We are entering into God's house. I'm not saying that we, we ought to or must come in and not say a word and, and sit silently and, and, and quietly until the service starts. There, 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 there may be something going on in someone's life where they do that sometimes. Maybe get here early and, and say, Brother Ray used to get, when he was able to get here on Wednesday nights, he can't anymore or he would be here, but he would always be here early. And he would be sitting here, all, only one in the sanctuary, reading his Bible. And that, that's good preparation for time that we're spending with God. You know, we're going to come in and we're going to meet with one another and we're going to be happy to see each other. We're going to greet one another. And we might even talk about how our week's been going before the service. And, and I believe that's something we're, we all will always do and always should do. Uh, but... When we are truly coming to God's house to worship the Lord, it's going to be different than us walking into the neighborhood community gym out down 1960 or something and getting ready to work out. It's going to be different than walking into a restaurant. It's different when we come into the house of God to worship the Lord and our conduct should show a great reverence for the Lord in His house. <clears throat> you know, there's a, there's a private school and, and there's a driveway that the people drive in, the parents drive in to drop their kids off. And when you pull into that driveway, it says, you are now on school premises, slow down. There's another sign a little later that says, seriously, slow down your car. And, and I'm not kidding. That, I, I haven't seen it with my own eyes, but someone told me about it. And then, it, and then it, another sign says, there are children walking around here. Dry, we mean it when we say the speed limit's five miles an hour. Another sign says, put your phone down. You're on school premises. There's a walkway and it, for kids to go by, and there's a sign that says, stop. Children are passing. The next sign says, we mean it. Stop, because kids are walking through here. Another one, stop before you go over the speed bump. It could damage your car, and we're telling you to stop. I mean, they put great emphasis on on what they expect when you enter in to drop your kids off. And and I kind of don't blame them, because when I see people flying into the school, I drop my kid off. And they're trying to get their kid in before the bell. And they're risking other kid. I'm about to go off on a tangent. But I, I, can, uh, I don't think that's extreme for those signs to be up like that. And I say all that to say, I'm sure that some churches, uh, some preachers are tempted to put up signs maybe that says, you know, you're about to enter the house of God. Get your heart, stop right there and don't come in until you get your heart and your mind ready. Make sure you have your Bible. You know, it's a temptation to put up signs like that. But then again, you know, entering into the house of God, you know, the child of God should be thinking about the Lord when they come into God's house. You know, you're tempted to have a sign that says, Turn cell phones completely off before you come in or just leave them in your car, you know, or something like that. But, but we're reminded right here in God's Word. And this is what it means. That's what all of this means. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. Be prepared to go to the house of God to worship the Lord. Maybe someone will say to their spouse Sunday morning before coming into Sunday school, hey, keep your foot, honey. Uh, I don't know, but whatever sticks with you. 
But we, so there's a conduct to consider when we go to the house of God. That's what God's Word is telling us. But also there's a concentration. Let's continue in verse 1. It says, And be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. I emphasized greatly to uh, a young crowd of kids when I taught on this verse several years ago about talking in, in church. That a time of worship is not for talking, but a time to listen to the Word of God as we read the Word of God and share God's Word in a time of worship. You know, attention spans seem to be getting worse with people. They seem to be getting shorter with people. As I say that, and, and I talk about how I really wanted to emphasize to some of our kids one time about, about it's not a time to talk, it's a time to worship. I also want to brag on our young people that, that they can hang in there with a 45-minute sermon. They really can. And, and they do well, and they, they, they do listen to the Word of God. You know, people, the attention span is so short today. People are trying to find a way to gain the interest of people in church, to go to church, to want to be there. Look, if the Word of God in the house of God doesn't do it, no one else is going to do, one, do anyone any favors by trying to gain their attention another way. We need to be and be more ready to hear. You know, I, I don't remember the message. I don't remember the point I was making. But I remember a statement I made in a service. In a, in a message that just your presence, just our presence together in God's house is a blessing. And, and, and I, I mean that, but at the same time, that doesn't mean that our presence without attention to God is okay. If we think that just being at church pleases God, it, it doesn't. Not, not just to be here. He wants our attention. May we leave different than we came in every time we come to church and, and for the better. You know, if we leave the same as we came in, man, a lot of times the preacher or the teacher gets a blame for that. But a lot of times it could be the people. It could be the attention. We're to go to the Lord's church to meet with the Lord for learning, for encouragement, for conviction, for instruction, for direction, for correction, to be more like the Lord when we leave. But in order for that to happen, we must give attention to the Lord. There's a hymn that we sing sometimes, and, and some of the words were changed. I'm 99% sure, and that bothers me. Correct me if I'm wrong, David. Uh, let's forget about ourselves and concentrate on Him and worship Him. That concentrate on Him, that's not all it hadn't always been there. That's different. I don't like it. <laughs> that is, when we get to that part, I don't like that little singing that little phrase. I, I want the old words back. But just because I say that doesn't mean they're not good words. Let's forget about ourselves and concentrate on Him. Now that's good words. I, I want the song back in the old words. But, but that's a good statement right there. There must be concentration so that, hey, what if, if we don't concentrate on the Lord, we're going to miss out on forgiveness? We're going to miss out on healing, on blessings, on conviction, on growth. 
How about an answer? How about some answers that might come to us in a Wednesday night small Bible study service? Or Sunday morning or Sunday night? Or how about the contentment that we can have or the patience that's being developed if we don't get our answer when we want it? We're missing out on all of those things if we don't give our attention to the Lord. And hey, I don't mean to pick, and I'm not even talking about this church, but just in general, I have seen people, I'm tired after watching some people go through their greatest efforts to not pay attention to the Word of God. I mean, it, it exhausts me to see that. And it's, and it's missing out on, on so many blessings that the Lord has in store for us. Yes, all of these things are, are for us. Forgiveness, healing, blessings, growth, answers, uh, being able to wait on answers, having endurance. When our attention is on the Word of God, God is speaking to us. And He's affecting us in a very great way. We must be ready to hear. Looks like the opposite of ready to hear here is hear, hear. Uh, forget that. Then the opposite of ready to hear is in this next part of the verse, then to give the sacrifice of fools. Some go to church as a routine. It's ritual. There's the falling into the rut in ritual. Somebody said, what do you call a coffin kicked out at both ends? And somebody else said a rut. And some get into a, a rut in their ritual routine and not listening to the Word of God. I mean... I mean, there are some who, who will do anything and everything you want them to do, but they are not going to sit down for that good part like Mary did at Jesus' feet and, and hear the Word of God. But the true worshiper goes to the house of God to hear the Word of God and nothing comes between. The one who prepares themselves to come to God's house and to hear his word, to, to know, to desire to know what God has to say to them tonight from his word. Every one of us must be careful we don't get in the rut of routine and miss what God is desiring to communicate to us. And that takes us to our next point from concentration in the house of God to communication, verses 2 and 3. It says, be not rash with thy mouth. And let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. There once was a frog, and he wanted to cross the lake. But he didn't really feel confident in his physical ability to get all the way across that lake. So he tries to come up with a plan, and he goes over to these two birds, and he takes a twig, certain size twig, certain length, and he, he tells the bird his, pl his plan. And the birds all for it. They think it's cool. They, he gets one bird to to grab this end of the twig in his mouth and the other bird to grab this end of the twig in his mouth and the frog latched on in the middle and the birds took off flying and everything's working out. They're headed across that lake. They get to about the middle and this turtle says, would you look at that? What a great idea. Who came up with such a great idea like that? And the frog says, I did splash. Opening our mouth at the wrong time in the wrong way can do great harm. It's way too common to speak before we think. I had a friend years ago. I'm sure, I'm sure we've all done it. But I had a friend and he was master of it, unfortunately, 
for a while. He's saved now and he's serving the Lord, but but I would hear him in a room. He was loud like like me. And I would hear him and I would hear him say something to someone and I would cringe and I would look at him and that look on his face out of his eyes said, I didn't realize what I said until after I said it. And it happened many, many times. Sometimes the use of words are very insincere and they don't touch the heart and they're not processed in the mind before they even are spoken. This is what Solomon is addressing here. We could go to James and just, just talk about words and, and the damage that words can do. The, the great things words can do, but out of the same mouth, off the same tongue, the damaging words that can happen. You know, is, is this just the way some people are and they can't be helped? You know, is, is that the case? Well, I, I don't think so. Because this, this detail, this thing that, that God has Solomon to bring up, and he, as we're talking about our, our mannerism, our behavior in the house of God, this detail isn't waved off. But we, we might just take this as, as a warning, if you will. It says, well, let me go ahead and read a little more again. Be not rash with thy mouth. Let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou... Upon earth. My old next door neighbor in my old house said, God's, God's too busy. He's, God's busy off in the universe doing stuff and he's not interested in the everyday little things that we're doing here. And, and someone might try to create some distance in the portion of this verse that says that God is in heaven and we are upon earth. What is he saying here? Well, Someone kind of blew off Christianity when I told them about it one time. And the way they did, they said, well, when I used to do wrong when I was a kid, my mom said, Jesus is watching, and nothing really happened. That's exactly what God is using Solomon to say here. That Jesus is watching, that God is in such a place that He sees. He sees what's going on. God sees all. Therefore, we must be careful what we communicate and how we communicate. We, cons- we should consider how we have double the amount of ears compared to mouths. We have two ears and we have one mouth. We should consider that and listen more than we speak. Continuing the same thought there in verse 3 that we already read on, on communication and speaking without thinking, without thinking of one, of what one is saying within themselves before they say it. You know, you, you, you can't put a lot of value on words that are said like that. There's, there's, there's a whole lot of words that are said sometimes. And there's no substance to them. There's nothing good in those words that are being said. You can't put a value on them. We we read here in this verse of a a multitude of business and and a multitude of words. It kind of makes me think of some that stay so busy doing and so busy talking that they never slow down to examine their own lives, to consider God. I knew a fellow who got me a job one time. I was about 20 years old. He was my boss, and he had a boss. And any time my buddy's boss came, came around, man, my buddy just got so busy running around and talking and doing so much and telling me and some others to do things we had never heard him tell us to do before that we didn't even know the job entailed. We didn't know how to do it. And man, he just ran around doing all of that. And then when the boss left, I said, what are you talking about? I said, I didn't do what you said because I have no idea what you're talking about. He said, oh, don't worry about it. The boss came in and all the words 
and all of his activity and everything he did amounted to, to nothing. It was, it was meaningless. It was some kind of show that he was putting on, you know, in front of him. And there was, there was no substance, substance to it whatsoever. Everything he exhausted himself doing and saying was absolutely meaningless. You know, I, I know we talk about the danger of being idle, but there's also a danger in being too busy in the wrong things. They, they may not seem like sinful things. They may not be sinful things, but they become that way when there's so much busyness that, that our focus is not on the Lord. This... I've made a statement many times that's never seemed to be popular. It's not mine. I heard it somewhere. But somebody said, busy means bound under Satan's yoke. We need to be busy serving the Lord. But busy in the wrong things, you know. I'll, I'll say, Seth will say amen to that kind of busy. That, that's the wrong thing. And, I, and I'll say it too. And, and we kind of have that, we have that point here of the, of the danger of busyness and unspiritual things. There's a lot of foolish, meaningless things, though they may not be sinful, they distract us from communication with God. And then that becomes sinful. Well, let's look at a commitment in verses 4 through 7. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than thou, than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice? and destroy the works of thine hands. I'll just stop right there for a minute. You know, I, I don't like the word bargaining. Uh, bargaining is a two-way thing, but I see a lot of, a lot of maybe selfishness in, in, in bargaining with someone over something. I, I don't like the thought of, of making the statement bargaining with God. It, it, it just doesn't sound right. I think of Hannah, though, Hannah did want a child, but Hannah promised God that she would give him her child if he would give her her child that she wanted. Hannah followed through on her promise. She made a sincere promise to God, and, and she followed through. We're not commanded to make promises to God. We're not obligated to make God promises. But if we do, it is very clear that we're to keep those promises that we make to God. Granddaddy said it this way, if you promise God you're going to run a mile and you break your leg, He's still expecting the promise. Because God only knows fulfilled promises. God doesn't know broken promises. He's expecting the promise to be fulfilled. Look, that was one way to say it. Bottom line, no excuses will fly with God for breaking promises. He's serious about vows that are made to Him. We're not to lie about the broken promise. We're not to cover up a promise in some way that, that we try to make to God. If we make a promise to God, we're to keep the promise that we make to God, and that pleases God. How, how can I please God? Make a sincere, real promise to God and keep it. You know, if one of the teenagers would have come up in ninth grade when I was teaching and said, Brother Kenneth, you, will you promise me that you will teach me all four years of my high school? I would be, that would be foolish for me to make that promise. I don't know what God's will is in that. But there are things that we can 
promise God sincerely and He's serious about us following through. It pleases God when we make Him promises and and keep those promises. And we're not obligated to. And I used to kind of say, don't make promises to God. Be careful or be careful about it. But at the same time, what happens when we think about our God? He's worthy of us making promises to Him. Let's make sincere ones to Him, though, that we can keep. If we don't keep it, the Bible says it arouses the anger of God. You know, I've heard somebody say, if you, will, if you will do this for me, I will be in church every Sunday for the rest of my life. Ur- urgent, flippantly, quick. And I, I don't suggest that at all. The, prom- the promise is going to have something to do maybe with what we want, but ultimately it's to be something for God's glory. Hannah had a child for God's glory, and God used him. Verse 7, and we'll close. For in the multitude of dreams and many words, there are also divers vanities. But fear thou God. Man, there are, there are those who get really excited about dreams in religion. You go to talk to someone about, about spiritual things and be, they don't want to talk about Jesus. They want to talk about dreams. What do you believe about dreams? What do you believe when I have a dream? You believe God gives me a dream and He's giving me some revelation through that dream? They're passionate about that and the meanings of them. Look what Solomon is saying here. That there's a whole lot of vanity in getting caught up in, in, in a whole lot of concern about stuff like that. You know, we, we can't ever get too overly concerned with fearing God, though. Solomon went through all of the world in this test and came back with nothing that stuck to him in a good way to satisfy him. And then he takes us to the house of God And he says, fear God. We're going to find out later that that's the conclusion to the whole matter. Reverencing God in our lives. He deserves our reverence. A special reverence ought to come about when we come into the house of God to worship the Lord. The the true worshiper, it will show... By conduct, by concentration, by communication, by commitment that is made to God. We're going to close now in a word of prayer. Um, Please remember those who are are traveling that we mentioned and those who will soon be traveling and can't wait to continue in Ecclesiastes next Wednesday. It's, It's so good to see everyone who is here and And I'm going to ask uh, Nolan Irvin if he will close our Bible study in a word of prayer. God bless you all.